um, uh, uh, seen actually the the rest of the series. This uh, this webinar is now a chance to uh, apply that knowledge um, and looking at um, Latin America and Caribbean. Um, the series, you know, in in general, is uh, designed to equip you with the knowledge about actors, issues, and forms, and um, to provide you with the sort of fundamental knowledge need to, needed to enable you to engage in cyber policy debate and start shaping the discussion to be respecting by design. Uh, we know that debates will differ from country to country, um, so we hope these videos and these Q&A sessions provide a starting point for you to um, sort of kickstart debates in your own context and to support and promote human rights um, and security in, in, a, in a way that's um, balanced. This online component of the training series is open to all and will feed into an in-person training that we're holding in a, in a few weeks, um, the, of the overall cyber capacity building training program. This chance to gain clarity on the key issues and avenues for engagement outlined in the um, Latin America uh, video, uh, which I hope you'll enjoy. And yeah, we're really interested in hearing your questions and about the priorities in the region and ways to engage. Um, this regional track will then be built upon in the in-person training to craft um, strategies for engagement. So um, without further ado, I shall um, hand it to Pancho, uh, Francisco Vera, um, our um, moderator today. Um, I mean, for me, what was the issue? We are talking about a uh, cyber policy and uh, in America. Uh, I mean, I am so so así que también a todos. And uh, I think we have an opportunity today to uh, count with these great uh, activists from the region. Uh, 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 on human rights and advocacy and in the cyber, in cyber issues and digital issues. We have also Ana Rossini, the Vice President for International Policy in Public Outlets, and uh, Valeria Betancourt, and she's the Manager of Communication and Information Policy at APC, the Association for Progressive Communication. So I have with me these three wonderful uh, women. Uh, the I have had the pleasure to work with them all of this uh, time. So I'm here to address your questions, your concerns on these issues, and also to be able to like uh, go a bit uh, longer that uh, from what we saw in the video. And uh, so you saw already saw the video. This ten minutes compressed a lot of different issues regarding. Um, you. Message in the chat. So, um, so we have the chance to see the video on these issues on the region. Uh, it will be translated soon for those that don't understand English. Uh, probably, if we did this, this video in Spanish, it would take like 20 minutes. You know that we always tend to speak a bit longer in Spanish sentences. But um, the actual issues in the video are like what uh, like uh, putting us together today. And specifically, I mean the cyber policy, and this is close to the concept of with digitality, uh, what we all are used to discuss in terms of, for instance, internet access, connectivity, human rights in the internet, necessity. Um, but this time, and in the context of these cyber talks and this uh, cyber policy course uh, that is uh, being done by uh, global partners, the focus on cyber security issues. So here, are how to have clear concept on what cybersecurity could be for the region, what the challenges are, and most important, uh, what the venues uh, and or, or what venues do we have for advocacy in America in regards with uh, human rights and uh, cybersecurity uh, or security in cyberspace. So focus in here that, that we will be discussing across this, uh, this Q&A session. Uh, I will let uh, pass Valeria and uh, Carol uh, introduce themselves like very shortly to say hello. Then we will jump into the uh, current questions and issues, uh, starting from like the uh, that we have. Like first, 
most press cyber issues in the region, then the specific cyber security concerns, and then the uh, actual like venues uh, and other avenues for advocacy in the region. So, uh, pass, back, Carol, uh, please uh, say hello to us. We want to hear your voice. In the for eight years now, and now I'm a consultant as Pancho said before, and uh, I hope to be here to discuss about the advocacy strategies, especially in terms of cybersecurity in uh, Latin America. Can you hear me? This is Valeria Betancourt from Ecuador. I'm based in Quito, in South America. I'm uh, looking forward to this discussion. I, I do feel that particularly in Latin America, facing a setback in not only in terms of uh, internet rights, but also in terms of the democratic system. So I think it's very good for us to articulate some ideas and discuss the strategies, how to counteract and how to respond to the shrinking space that civil society currently has. So looking forward to talking to you. Uh, this is Carolina. Uh, you're all well, and as Francisco said, uh, public knowledge, international work, and uh, have been said, I think was a very crucial moment of history in terms of democracy and uh, hard questions. And I think security is in the core of those issues. Well, um, already passed, Carolina Valeria. Having uh, like uh, present themselves, I think I'm jumping to the issues. And the first question that I have, and it's a very like overarching question, so may uh, pass Valeria and Karina will have their like emphasis in there. It's like what the most pressing cyber and human rights issues uh, in the region and why? What what the most pressing cyber policy do we have? So we'll go through like uh, human rights, and if you remember the webinar on human rights. We have arcing issues, I mean, in freedom of expression, privacy, so, and also in internet access. And building from those three, I think we have like very urgent challenges in the region uh, in, in regards with uh, freedom of expression, for instance. Uh, we have this, uh, <coughs> this uh, censorship uh, or internet access, uh, sometimes abusing copyright, which is uh, the case, for instance, uh, of Ecuador. Uh, that they were like go hiring this company in Spain for to like a uh, uh, content takedowns in YouTube. Some challenges from freedom of, for freedom of uh, on the trade arena. I mean, uh, free trade uh, sounds very good in paper, but when it comes to actual agreements, they affect the way we communicate and use the internet. And that's the case, for instance, nowadays in TPP, where we have this. New, I mean, responsibilities and obligations that are uh, being negotiated. I mean, going to implement the big, big for intermediaries. So probably we will have, I mean, or this approach of having intermediaries working for the actual like, uh, corporate holders instead of for the their time. Uh, what other issues? Just to new and then try to see. If, I mean, past Valeria Karina want to jump into some specific one. Let's say the blocking of specific content and our, our applications over the internet. We have this last week this in Argentina, for instance, to bring the Uber app, but not only to main, uh, forbid the, the use of Uber, but to like in network le in, a, in a network level, the use of, of Uber as an app. So that implies like blocking, arbitrarily uh, blocking, not only one specific function, but the access of a whole like a uh, uh, content or a website. Uh, seen in Brazil these last cases with uh, WhatsApp and the judicial orders to take down or block the app for a certain period of hours. And again, this is a huge challenge because it's very at this point based on the UN rapporteurs that uh, selective blocking of applications or contents in the internet actually represents a threat to the freedom of expression. And things that we have been seeing, for instance, in Venezuela on the on these same issues. I think also a very important uh, line of work. And 
privacy, and this will probably be more connected with cybersecurity and the surveillance part. I have seen all of these I mean, new technologies that governments are using to monitor their citizens, um, the use of malware to actually uh, our right to privacy, but also the lack of development in other issues, like, for instance, the laws, uh, the laws or act of legislation on data protection that can equal or uneven among the regions. So we have countries that are working very hard to have this levels of protection, and we have countries that actually are moving in a very slow or non pace uh, to that matter. So that also represents a huge of what we have now in the cyber policy issues. And I think one more on the internet access side is how this concept of neutrality that was very in the region in terms of I mean, I mean, access to the internet without any discrimination at an encore level. Now it's being bypassed by a lot of companies, especially these like zero rating uh, models that represents a lot of challenges. And I think particularly the, the bigger challenges, um, this is being marketed as like free access to some services over the internet, either Facebook, WhatsApp. Um, it's very hard for time sometimes to like address all this issue with the regular people, the users of the internet, that they sometimes feel like they are having something for free, then they, this mean internet activists want to take uh, away. So, I mean, I love the uh, mic to pass. Uh, whatever issue do you want to take from this, I mean, just try to go deeper in, in there. It's important to consider as as for the context of uh, you know, uh, democracies or in, in in Latin America, where are passing through a period of uh, you know a hard period, if I can say in that manner. Uh, so this kind of um, um, our human rights are bigger than than ever. I will put on the um, th threats, you know, uh, we know that governments uh, like Mexico, Ecuador, Brazil, for example, are um, on uh, the contents of social media. Uh, this is something that we every day, for example, in Ecuador, I see Alfredo Velasco is in here. Maybe he can jump in later on that. Uh, another thing that it, to me is very important, and we have seen this like the last, I would say, two weeks, is the problem with the zero based threats. Uh, we see this, uh, this um, um, Canadian uh, organization. What's the name of this Canadian organization? who made this incredible investigation. Citizen Lab. Uh, Citizen Lab. Citizen Lab. And uh, we, he, he uh, they that uh, Mexico uh, was buying this kind of, um, you know, uh, this kind of technology that uh, tried um, the survey stress. This is something that is uh, important, I think. And Talk is um, the emergence of a cyber industrial complex in Latin America. Uh, in terms of that, of course, governments are buying more surveillance tech. Uh, so local companies are producing this technology. We can see that, for example, in Brazil, uh, where they are producing surveillance. Uh, the, I, I remember the El Guardian uh, software was actually by, by, uh, by uh, Uruguay, and that was a uh, technology uh, made by a uh, um, young uh, company. Uh, but also what is super worrying that uh, complex is that uh, there's a kind of uh, new intermediary that is a very particular figure here in Latin America because it's usually the companies are not buying uh, directly to the companies, but with a new intermediary, which is usually a former military member who now has a product. So 
So it's a kind of revolving door, which is very interesting to consider, but uh, the military in America is, uh, you know, with the sheets and, uh, uh, and um, all that tragic, tragedies, you know what I mean? So those three things that you have been to the to the to the things that you said before, pension. And uh, with Karina, uh, she wanted to add something, and then we go with Valeria uh, to add um, like uh, to shapes or more like uh, elements to this conversation in terms of what the most pressing sites uh, we are having now in, in the region. Um, and I think I would like to suggest to give a step back or a bark, whatever you want to do. My job stopped barking here. Sorry, people. <laughs> uh, but the point is, I've been talking more and more to policymakers in the region because for a series of reasons, I've been inviting to speak to those folks by the American Bank Development, or the World Bank, or, or even the State Department. One thing that I have noticed, and it's important for us to think on the consequences, is a lot of them don't have any idea of, of what technology is, what internet is, and what WhatsApp is or does, or a certain platform is or does. Or they don't have any idea what of what internet governance means. So all the concepts that are very basic for us, for this community here, are not part of the vocabulary of these policymakers. And when they face a certain threat, they choose somebody that deals with threat, which is the police or the military or maybe the judges, right? And these people, judges, are not informed Right? When you see the takedown of WhatsApp in Brazil, you see a poorly formed judge that took WhatsApp out of the air for a day for the, everybody in Brazil, not just for that specific user. So why am I saying that? It's because a lot of times we decide not to engage with these people and you know, talk to them saying they are the bad guys. And maybe that's not the case in some, in some cases, right? I am, we are all suspicious of politicians. I understand we are all suspicious from the military. But we understand that very, 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 very few people in those sectors understand what we are talking about. Uh, so, and I've seen that in first hand with these past trainings I've been giving. And I think that helps us to say, okay, this is doing something horrible, right? What's up to monitor what the certain user is doing? Let's go talk to this judge and figure out why he thinks that's the best way of doing something. Do a scurry, do, do protest, have other tactics to with these people. Anyway, so that's one thing we wanted to bring to this uh, dialogue. Thank you. Lydia? You want to? Pancho, I cannot agree more on this over that you and Pat and Carolina have provided. And I want to add another element. I think all these issues that we are experiencing and witnesses, witnessing on, on the internet are really in the internet in and environment. We have been advocating for years and defending the possibility to use the internet not only for reinforcing the exercise of human rights, but also as a tool and a platform for democracy, for giving economic equity, social equity. And I think the fact that the internet is becoming so unsafe in terms in various dimensions is really also preventing us from using the internet as a tool for social change and for social justice. So to also frame this is only in how restrictive the policy developments are becoming in terms of exercising human rights, but also it is the possibility of us to use the internet for incredible possibilities for a better and more positive development. So in that sense, I think we need to look 
uh, to look at, at, at a more comprehensive and more holistic framing these challenges that we are seeing on the, on the internet. So not only in terms of the minimization of the internet, not only in terms of so in terms of analyzing uh, how the the, the the policy developments are impacting on civil and political rights, but we should also pay attention to how this trend is impacting on the possibility to also reward the exercise and the enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural rights on the internet. So, because it is not only impacting freedom of expression, privacy, access to knowledge, it is also impacting uh, the right to education, the right to health, the right to use the internet as a, pla a platform for public deliberation. Uh, these things are in risk, in my view, and, and we should uh, take those other dimensions into account, I think. Yeah, I agree more with, with all of you. I, I mean, we, I started talking about like specific cyber threats that's on cyber policy related with human rights in the region. But I think it's also done, as you all said, I take a step back and I'm from what I can add for, for that is like saying that uh, I far, I mean, been with this notion that you can only go forward in terms of accessing uh, or having like more rights in the internet or having a better like cyberspace or security or more freedom of expression. And two to three years have shown us that probably it is also possible to uh, go back, I mean, backwards in this arena. And that's for a bit depressing uh, before being uh, going to, to work to, 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 with, uh, we used to work in Derechos Digitales. And when, I mean, we saw this promise like a, I mean, horizon or like a landscape. And the last two years has become uh, very clear that you can go back the skin get nasty and for one side but in the it's also I mean how can we be a bit distance how can we resist better how can we engage as Carol was saying like politicians or judges in a more creative and new ways no not to do what everybody is doing all the time because it's like we have this hurt where yeah we, we we are all like any petitions I mean that's a bit in the past at this point um, so, I mean, uh, how can we address these issues? And this is also with cybersecurity because, like, four to five years ago, this was not an issue for like uh, the regular internet user. It's also an issue for I uh, you know banking companies or military. But just four to five years, we have seen how, for instance, cybercrime has has affecting like a lot of people. Probably some of you are also affected by this, not, not all activists, but also a citizen or person that has like a bank account and uses internet banking. Uh, so we have seen how this has become an actual issue in the relations among countries between the militarization of the internet, as Valeria was saying, is also a thing now. So it's like securitization of the debate, the internet also has consequences. And one is since internet is in our daily lives. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, for countries, so especially, especially for law enforcement agencies, they see uh, these huge threats on the internet and they want to react. And they want to start with because it's like most probably the first issue, then we can move to cybercrime laws or to some other like strategies. But I think surveillance is actually an issue in Latin America. As Paz was saying, I mean, there's a variety of uh, has contracted with this very like company that was in the shadows until like one month ago, and then it turns that they are using zero days like um, vulnerabilities to get to iPhones. Uh, we were uh, we were was being considered like the most safe uh, platform in the So we have these like uh, weak spots, and we need to to address this. So I think speak more 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 on, on the surveillance side are like uh, accessing our communications or are like sometimes trying to uh, go there uh, activists. What do you think is a question for uh, Karina, Paz, and Valeria in that order. Uh, what do you 
pressing, like the most pressing, uh, no, no more pressing, but uh, we address this sort of issue in a, can we actually achieve some change with the, the countries? This policy, but also probably a little activism, so I'm leaving it up to you. Uh, Carol, first, I'm waiting for you, and then uh, you cover other topics, but I want to bring one specific topic, and I'm sh I'm happy to share my cheer on it. Better uh, off the process and international uh, cross-border data. Uh, so we have the Snowden revelations, blah 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 blah. So if that's angle I'm touching. I'm sure my friends will do that. Uh, what is that government do not know? And I have to tell you, nobody has come with a solution nowadays to enforcement and, and uh, a surveillance that is actually based on the process because it's not always that some, I think there is a better word for surveillance, but, the, but there are cases that that is necessary to fight, right? But when a surveillance is permitted by law, uh, it's transparent and accountable, we hope, uh, are still pushing the barriers of that process. So one uh, recent case, I don't know if you guys are following, uh, the Microsoft Ireland case uh, on surveillance that Microsoft may get to give the data to the U.S. Uh, was it, um, and they won, but now you propose a natural treaty between, for example, U.K. and U.S. And that we will set the model for the rest of the world. Uh, there is this specific words in the in the bilateral proposal. I'm actually sleeping for a meeting in Geneva about this. And the point there is uh, they want to assess it, and sometimes with gag orders. What are gag orders? A lot of legislations actually say you can't surveil. No worries, just mute your mic and we will wait for you and we will go over uh, area now. Okay. That Carolina is, is, is very important. We, we, we see that governments are completely ready to circulate uh, to process and, and human rights. Uh, and that is obviously a reality that we are facing. However, part of the problem I, I think is that governments have realized that um, not realized that it is important to legislate and regulate the perspective of security as used to conceive security, security as the basis for the society of human rights. Part of the problem is that uh, governments are, are actually embracing uh, a norm of security threat to the, you know, the best service, but very risky and dangerous notion of national security. National security. I think that that is the framework with, which allows government to circumvent uh, to process, to circumvent democracy, and to circumvent any notion of proportionality in relation to surveillance because surveillance has existed, existed forever. However, uh, however the, the, the fact that the, the fact applying this notion of uh, national security to the cyberspace um, um, I think provides the ground for governments to, to own what should be doing in one of the practices in relation of of uh, of the accountability they uh, uh, provide and the transparency they should have in terms of their practices and the objectives of surveillance and so on. So for me, it is very important to to look back at the 
revisit and even reframe this notion of security that is not only not only framing the discourse but even uh, uh, being used at the ground for government to do this type of uh, regulation and adopting this type of practices in in SP. You have anything else to add in here? We have yes. a lot of more questions, so you are still free to. Oh, yes, I, I, I agree, but I want to engage with regarding these issues, but also with technology companies, I think. Some focus on governments, which is, of course, natural, but I think uh, technology companies have something to do with this debate. Um, you know, the lack of accountability of international companies in the like, context of the world itself, you know, to me, is unacceptable. Some uh, of those big companies uh, just don't have a legal representation in our countries, in Latin America, uh, which is which make uh, more difficult to, uh, you know, establish a dialogue with them in order to uh, talk is about this security, human rights, and things like that. So I don't think that I will, you know, add in this conversation is that we have to, of course, uh, engage with uh, with the governments. But so uh, I would say we have to do an effort as a civil society to engage with, with companies also. Yeah. Um, well, Carol said that probably she won't be able to come back because of her fire alarm. So, uh, but said uh, I think it's very, very important yeah, to address this I mean first is the due process side I mean to uh, have some safeguards on how the governments are operating have some limits because that what that's what uh, government power should be like limited constrained other powers by delay by laws and most more than of that by human rights and uh, the responsibility of the private sector whenever we talk about cyberspace or internet it's not about um, governments, uh, but also how private have this enormous power. They are more powerful than some countries, like countries actually in the internet. So they're also uh, have, have to be taken in account and be responsible for what they do. So specific questions, so we will be addressing some of them. I think in some of them probably also uh, part of the audience we want to jump in either in written form or if they request in by in the internal channel uh, we can if they want to intervene also they will be welcome because there's this question you know in the video we have one specific case and it's also related with surveillance and in Paraguay um, this great organization Teddy they were able to actually pour some of I mean change the way that a uh, and society sees sort uh, of data retention in this, in this case uh, in relation with some bill that was trying to uh, pass in the Congress, and they campaign and they they were able to actually change this, the shape of the discussion. So that at least, or for me, that I suggested to add this case was a big, like a huge success. Uh, that probably in the human rights activism world. These successes last very short because we have a lot of and a lot of issues that actually affect us. Uh, in this particular case, it was a positive experience that we shared in the video. So I would like to invite uh, uh, and Valeria to see to talk about what specific can say the actors take from this campaign against the data retention law in Paraguay, and then Marika. No, you're there. So if you want to jump in, you just tell us, and we you will be more than welcome to to join us in this conversation. Is my guy here? So probably will say whatever. Okay. Well, yeah. This is one of the most incredible campaigns in Latin America regarding this and human rights. Uh, I think uh, this kind of campaign. Something which was to speak very clearly to the uh, uh, legislators what the problem. You know, that would 
difficult to do it. Um, I'm thinking in what uh, Carolina said before, how hard it is to uh, find a politician that can understand the technical debate uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in a clear way. So for me, a big this um, uh, of this campaign, the this clear message that they uh, do the you know the pollutions regarding the issues. I think uh, if a common pressure. I mean, this campaign, Mary Cameron will say this better than that I think that a was strong uh, and it was a lot of pressure, but it was work. Um, and I think it's super important to to uh, achieve, but also it's a it's a lot of pressure for the uh, organization itself. So really, uh, 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 you know, one of the most important ones to nice and combine is to understand that you're going to, you know. Uh, of effort and no time in there, and not all of the organizations are uh, in, the, in that in that you know. So yes, this I would say that those two things are super important in this campaign. Okay, okay. curious to to hear what Mary Carmen has to say, but in my view, I think the success element of this uh, campaign was. The, that it was very decentralized. It, it also, even though the, there was some, you know, um, focal point providing providing elements for the analysis, particularly in relation to the impact of the eventual legislation. I think it's a very decentralized. So there was a, a very important and crucial aspect of uh, social appropriation of the campaign. And I think another element that contributed to be successful, success, successful. Sorry, was the fact that it was set, um, in the in the historical context because of the of the history of democracy and dictatorship in, in Paraguay. I think that the fact that the and other organizations uh, put the campaign and the discourse into into a, an historical context. How these the inter policy developments. We're going to follow the, you know, the, the trend of uh, of um, of undermining of democracy. I think it, it was it was really good. I think, in, particularly in Latin America, I do find that uh, that uh, setting our advocacy goals and campaigns in 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 political context is important, particularly because of the tradition that social movements and activists on human rights have had in the region and the contribution they have had in terms of, of the democratic uh, discourse. So I think in my view those were some of the aspects that contributed to the campaign to be successful. Thank you, Pastor Valeria. Um, Valeria, I, this English is not for names. Uh, yeah, I was chatting with Mari Carmen on the in channel because it's to come to other so probably won't be able to speak. But something that already Aslan Valeria said also, Carmen said that, that they, they, you already told, told like lots of important things. But one thing that Carmen added was very important is, you know, in Paraguay there's this like indigenous language need that most people talk in the country. The campaign was actually a, a call like Pirawebs uh, because of the Pirawebs who were like the um, for the dictatorship. Uh, so what Mari Carmen told me that the Guarani was very important. It's an indigenous language that we, which a lot of men, majority of the population in Paraguay relates to. It's because it felt more, uh, it made more an inclusive campaign. So that's a thing to take in account. That's what I was telling you. Before. I mean, how signatures uh, fill this form, and then we will send emails to our representatives. I don't know well has work or we work in the region uh probably it's more uh, from foreign experiences so that's something to take in account how can we relate our campaign or our issues with local issues with our history with our own, our own rights violations in our own 
countries. Most of them in Latin America, we have our own, like, not very history. And very, very important issue uh, to, to take uh, from this campaign from, from TEDIC. Uh, this other question from, uh, I don't have the name from the, where it came, but it says, in delicate context, like in Brazil, civil society and academia join efforts to tackle threats coming from so many sources. Legislative, judiciary, surveillance, undermining of narco civil and encryption, etc. What are the best strategies to adopt? We don't have Carol with us. I know Paz and Valeria will be able to add some insights in this, but take in a, especially those that are from outside Latin America, that Latin America is a country, it's a continent, probably it's a continent by itself. So we can give some insights of what we see from outside. Probably, I mean, it's not that we can have the ultimate recipes, not in our own country, so probably not not even for Brazil. But I'm very interested on hear what past or what say because of Brazil, you know, that this going through this moment with the executive branch has their own problems, like for and such. And we have also judiciary threats, we have the surveillance because of these big events in such times. So I'm very curious of what you can add, uh, Valeria. And yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, 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 it's helpful to discuss something uh, the cybersecurity issue when we're doing advocacy. And um, even if it's obvious, um, you know, information security issues, it's because when issues are discussed as a security issue, Given a sense of urgency and importance, and um, you know the governments start to doing uh, emergency action or taking special measures, and oh, the the this called securitization is the word which I think is this is you know uh, so um, the problem with you know that discourse of that of that kind of tactic is that extraordinary or emergency actions are called are called for we you know must um, make sure that these measures do not have negative consequences consequences affecting human rights on the group. my best idea especially in brazil but in all latin america also is to very carefully as you know social organizations Choose the topic and uh, talk about the topic, and make some issues like data protection in some contexts is not uh, very common. It's not very good to take from the, the point of view of um, you know uh, um, a security or a civil security issue. I think we need to talk about that in terms of strategy uh, in order to protect uh, you know our human rights. That that discourse will have will have in human rights. Yes, something okay. to add. Yes, I think I my my interpretation of what what is happening in Brazil is set back in terms of uh, not only the civil the civil work of the internet, but also the threats against the um, the Comité Gestor de Internet, the Internet Steering Committee, it's a multi-stakeholder nature. For me, they are part of a bigger effort of the stabilization of the democratic processes and institutions. So we have to, to look at what is going on in the online environment as part of this bigger is happening in, in, in Brazil. And, and for me, part of the response that civil society should fight is to try to strengthen um, community media, community media and popular media and alternative media channels, right online, of course, but also offline. So for me, clearly the internet has a very critical role to play in Brazil to interact you know, the official discourse 
and the interpretation of reality that this discourse is making. So you, um, uh, in civil society organization, organizations that have been defending uh, online in Brazil will have to also jump in and start um, uh, paying attention to the issue of plural media. Because particularly in Brazil, we have seen uh, we have seen how powerful uh, traditional media, corporations, and congregates are in not only uh, not only framing the discourse and the interpretation of reality, but also setting a structural conditions for a specific, you know, um, a specific uh, political economic interest uh, to be impacted. So I think they are playing a critical role on this. And then we should counteract and really strengthen and provide alternative avenues and channels for community media to reach. So I think that is part of the challenge ahead uh, of the Brazilian civil society. We are ready to support those, those efforts, of course. Yeah, something very important from uh, your both interventions. I think one not uh, uh, framing this only in cybersecurity terms or like not even like, like strictly rights terms. I think Paz has a very good point with that because it's not a technical discussion and Valeria's answer uh, makes this even more clear. I mean, this is about how democracy is working in some countries, how to affect that. And let me say something and I will take some liberty. Probably Carol will want to kill me after this, but okay, she's not here. Um, I think uh, clothing, I mean, facing that uh, Marco Civil at this point, Marco Civil is you know, important principles. It was a very big achievement, but I think what we need to defend from there is like the, partic the public participation that the law had, the social movement that probably did uh, make the Marco Civil possible. Because the Marco Civil is just one law that probably will be superseded by many other laws. You will that even now. Even from the beginning of the Marco Civil, when you see like cybercrime laws or distinctions from judges in terms of what was up, uh, block. so keeping civil as if the it was the real achievement. I mean, as I was, as we were telling, laws and human rights sometimes can go backwards. Marco Civil is just one text that is good. Point the important thing I think is. Uh, what was achieved in terms of uh, public awareness or where to move forward in terms of principles. Because if we think that the Marco Civil has this one article that, that says something and we need to expect that, I mean, the, with so many fronts of uh, undermining of human rights, like judicial, executive power, not mentioned the Congress, I think we fall on some more like principle stances rather than just one law that can be interpreted in many ways. So. I think that's one thing I, I, I think uh, it was necessary to say. Uh, um, question, this is very interesting because not very familiar with uh, the Caribbean. So this will show that how these uh, sort of cyber crime conceptions are not country feel that has taken a lot of our time, but also I think that uh, there is the recent passing of the Cyber Crime Act in St. Vincent. It's an example of a cyber law that has many concerning implications for freedom of expression in that Caribbean country. It does defamation to include an expression and in some very extremely vague definitions of concepts like cyber and harassment. What decisions would you make towards addressing some of these concerns given has already passed? I just want to have starting point. Uh, this is a common problem among Latin American countries. We have seen in Peru, even Brazil or Chile, how criminal laws, not the cyber criminal laws, are being abused to uh, uh, activists or attack on the internet. But also, uh, as the counterpart, how can we be grounded uh, on principles on how can we defeat this cyber, cyber harassment? Maybe the law is not the solution, but we need 
still to take that because this like ultra liberal approach of saying okay we don't want any uh, restriction on the speech in the internet is actually causing damage and I know that probably uh, both of them they have really a good uh, insights in terms of this because there's also this other ways to exercise violence through the internet and how can we deter that without making all of all of a criminal problem or not uh, solving everything with jail. So then, Bali, I am waiting for your... Uh... I think it's important to work with other organizations besides the organizations working in digital rights. Uh, we need to do an effort to talk from, you know, gender organizations, feminist organizations, uh, organizations, etc., etc., uh, because we need to establish a kind of dialogue with them. Because uh, we have the same idea to protect our human rights. Sometimes, uh, um, you know, because we don't have this kind of um, communications between organizations of civil society. Um, there are some, uh, you know, mistakes regarding, you know, technical issues. For example, uh, you know, thinking that uh, online harassment is gonna be end if we censor, you know, in it. So the first thing I would say is that we have to do the effort to uh, extend bridges of dialogue, dialogue with uh, with the other nations and. To, to, and this is, this is the first step to 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 fight you know, this this kind of laws. Valeria, we will pass absolutely. Uh, I think it is important in terms of effort uh, in terms of alternative approaches. That we, I think we have to unpack how it is to adopt criminal approaches to information and to free expression. So I think that's very important. And we have a very key role to play in civil society organizations to apply those, those adaptive approaches. And, I, and now in the case of San Vincent, it was San Vincent? St. Vincent? Yeah, St. Vincent. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm not very familiar with the, with the policy that has been adopted. The, sorry to hear it has been adopted. But another area of advocacy for civil society in, in that situation, I think, is to focus on the remedies mechanism, the remedies side. I think, I think obviously, the, the, the law will be impact on the rights of rights, and then it is important for civil society to to present some and feasible and viable proposals in terms of what is needed for remedies. So remedies, I think, it's very important to focus on that and from the you know the legal uh, view, but also in terms of how important they are uh, for um, uh, reinforcing role that society has as an actor for uh, demanding uh, accountability from governments. So that is one area for advocacy to explore. There are other experiences that could uh, um, provide some inspiration uh, from other countries in terms of how civil society has been advocating for establishment of a proper and effective uh, remedy mechanism that be used. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, very important thing that you said, uh, you both told that is this considering the involved communities on the actual, like, uh, after by these decisions. And I'm not talking about the guys who will be like judicial because of what they said in the internet. When you have these laws trying to protect the children, uh, the harass, the weak. A lot of these are not taking in consideration even what these victims are actually claiming. For. I mean, have this approach of have this approach of how oh, we will decide what is good, and it's 
as human rights defenders is the way to go is to be the same ivory tower that the policy makers are and trying to decide in be on behalf of people what's better for, for, for them. And talk with feminist movements, uh, uh, movements, especially when they actually have children in, in the movement because you have many grown ups organizations speaking on behalf of them. You can see and you can get a lot of like very useful uh, insights. Uh, we really are one looking forward, not sometimes, but having mechanisms for defend themselves or, or as, as Maria said, remedies. Not this, this is not an issue of like, getting people to jail. That's not a remedy a lot of times. That's one way to punish people and even have the actual background. And that's one important thing. The advocacy recommendation side, I mean, uh, this, this, so I don't want to go over the same issues, but probably exploring you have criminal law, like um, a, a strategic litigation or going to see like if you can go to court to uh, get this like a, a or override because of constitutional issues is something that a lot of times work, especially when you have criminal because criminals tend to be very sensitive to this overreach of the law. Uh, one important uh, thing uh, from from this, an important thing is when we discuss cybersecurity or is narrow the terms. What security is for these purposes? This is not a relation or debate relation within with the internet. What do you want to defend? Uh, I know the confidence in cyber or the use of online banking or avoid like uh, the steal of information. Well, probably uh, punishing cyber uh, harassment in vague terms is not actually helping to that. So you, you have also focus to have discussion on those issues because if you have security laws that has a lot of super cyber threats, but half of them are not actually cyber threats. I mean, government are because you can see in the real world as well. So you need to take lessons from there and probably it's not a cyber, cyber, cyber issue. It's mostly a, an issue that you can address using other means. So that's another tip when you discuss these laws. I think it's very narrow, the debate of what you want to protect because these of, of these things are adding cyber uh, uh, before any other world. Uh, it's making it very hard to, to discuss in a, in a more like nuanced and technical manner. And sometimes when you have to have this, you need to have this discussion. We have a question. Uh, okay. it says, now in a time where governments in the region are actively working on policies on security and other topics related. But there are like Peru, where uh, uh, the, the question comes from, that don't have any policies or approaches to that topic. In the case of his or her organization, um, they need to be part of the discussion inside the government processes in order to bring a civil society point of view of security to them. Any solution about can we, a civil society organization, need to face this approach to be successful? Okay, let me switch my jacket first because I will have to talk about a former government officer in this issue. Last two years, I was drafting national cybersecurity strategy for Chile. We really hope that it will be published at some point. And I mean, it's important to civil society to push these boundaries for civil society to understand what. The achieve in a national cybersecurity policy. This is not an act, not a constitutional provision, probably won't have any action. So setting principles on how do a country, how a country wants to address its security concerns. And civil society view in this matter is very important. And I can say on behalf of government officers that probably we will be under fire, but uh, providing useful input to government officers. I mean, they make this actionable in a current uh, cybersecurity policy. And that requires some looking at, I uh, mean, some other policies around the world, what you usually do with those policies, and actually ask, because if you ask for a 
uh, like black, you know, forbidding all like uh, surveillance technologies. It's not the place or in a uh, cybersecurity policy place. But we can demand a cybersecurity policy to have a from the government that they want expanding backdoors for uh, internet services, for instance. And that is possible. So that's a challenge. And I, uh, there's an example, I mean, of an organization that did things very good in here, uh, because I also participated uh, in the national cybersecurity process. I think Fundación Carisma in Colombia, they did a terrific job on addressing these issues of participating government. And in Colombia, it's a, you know, has many uh, securitization concerns. I think you see the first national cybersecurity strategy from 2011, and you see the last one, you get a huge leap on how to these things in terms of uh, using cybersecurity to like uh, development, to human rights, probably not, I mean, uh, the golden standard in these issues, but it did this giant leap. So that's a suggestion. But I also want to hear from past and the other thoughts on this. So how can you advocate from civil society? Uh, I was in civil society until two years ago, so I'm a bit rusty right now on those issues. Uh, what can you add on, on into this? I mean, what do a civil society and how to articulate it, this actually be effective, not only in like providing input, as I said, but also in a political matter, how to raise this issue in terms of activism. Valeria so, Ampas. Okay, so I think that the, when there is little room at a level to approach government officials uh, to, you know, to show the civil society organization it's always good to um, to use uh, the the regional mechanism and processes that we have. For instance, particularly I, I would say the intergovernmental processes that we have in the region. It's a good, uh, very good avenue to approach and closer to governments and to share civil society perspectives on issues. So, for instance, I participate this webinar are familiar of have heard of the ELAC process. The ELAC process is the result of the World Summit of the Information Society, and it is the intergovernmental process in which governments are issues, issues related to the development of the society, including the development of policy and policy related issues. So I think a very good uh, for us to raise concerns, but also to share some perspectives. The uh, process has a ministerial conference every That is a very good space, in my view, to, to, to share these views from civil society. Particularly, as I was saying, if there is not uh, uh, abilities to, with government at the national level. It's also always the possibility to organize public uh, discussions, public fora in, at national levels, invite media. Media could play a very important role to make these issues public, to put them, uh, to put them on the public sphere and to, and to discuss the implications. So point media for sure could, could reach uh, to govern, government officials. And like to keep trying to keep trying to invite government officials to to stay hold their discussions at the national levels. It is always a, a, an opportunity to to try to understand the position of both sides and really to bring corporations in as past was pointing out at some point it's it's crucial. So uh, th those are processes that usually take a, a, a long, long time, and the results are not uh, always positive, evident in the short term. So it's something that we keep, we keep trying, we should keep trying, and to work both at the national and the regional and the global levels. So maybe. I just want to add, but uh, uh, in how to approach to the government in terms of, again, strategy and discourses. Uh, sometimes we believe that all the people understand the languages of human rights, and 
read the case sometimes in terms of security duty. It's very clear when we have to talk with some uh, military, you know, elements inside of the security policies in our countries, and we know that. Uh, I mean, Chile, in Argentina, in Brazil, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the military people is, we know, issues with human rights. So we have to be very careful to see the strategies to approach them uh, in order to, of course, defend human rights, but doing in a way that they trust, you know what I mean? And not to close the doors and say, okay, this is, this is like NGOs, we don't want to talk with them, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is super important. And sometimes we don't think enough in that kind of strategy. Yeah, I really agree with you. Just recall, because I used to work in defense these last years that the military, uh, there's an actual issue in there. I mean, you see in Brazil under the surveillance, uh, uh, cyber surveillance, for instance, in terms of uh, considering the Olympics and the World Cup, or Colombia, all these operations that took place these last years, and surveillance also, and hacking. So it's a difficult issue, and I think there's a hope for civil society to get to some environments that probably are not as comfortable to it's not an easy task. It requires of uh, patience, uh, thick skin. Also, I think because sometimes you hear things that are not like <laughs> what you're hearing. It happened to me. But how can you frame the role of the security community in your country in terms of like uh, executing or after criminals and activists? But how can you? Make this a new mission on how can the security community be also responsible for safeguarding the human rights of the population. And you do this very hard sell because it's very difficult. Can, can you give them this mission and say, okay, you are also in charge of our security and security involves the extent of our human rights. So it's not only my it all the time to the or military, but also trying to uh, bring it together. Uh, I mean, to have someone pass this because sadly they have this role, they have these resources, and they need also to create some empathy from their side to this side and trying to understand from this civil society side what it look like to be in the other side of the air. Especially in when you see that probably it happens uh, they, that we, people will go after to say, okay, why didn't you take care of us? So, I think there's this need to, to to try to put in the other tools, also from a human also from a human rights perspective. Uh -huh. Okay. So another question comment that I saw in the chat recently. Uh, let me see. Okay. Yeah. Um think, uh, uh, in Mexico, happened something similar. Said a presented a cyber crime initiative that includes all those vague concepts with a campaign emphasizing or how um, institutional was this law. Uh, um, and that sort of, uh, I'm reading the question. Uh, not the strategy to tackle real problems to freedom of expression online. Have passed in this law that was proposed in Mexico, uh, the constitutional claim ready to present it before the constitutional courts to go and try to take the down in there. And then that also took off a chamber. I think that's a very good experience how to also use these tools and you like, it's not as a threat, but you, you just let them know that you are ready to take down this law using all legal means that you have at hand. It's a very good way to deter uh, scrap uh, legislation to, to be. So, uh, so uh, in part of this same conversation, if you see the video, we we talk about things. Video, so, oh yes, uh, uh, Valencia, the um, process. Uh, uh, so all governance process, so like governmental cooperation, many good venues to try to advocate. But again, and I, I, I will go 
later with uh, Valerian Pan later, but uh, the issue of what can you ask for them. But these are like long processes, just like the governance processes are. So, have some realistic goals to achieve in those spaces. How who can quiz? What can you bring to the, to the table? It's like very important because at some point we talk a lot in this minute, in this like 10 minutes. How can we work with governments, policymakers, security bodies, uh, judges? But when multinational venues, I mean, what actually achieved in the OAS, for instance? The video is pretty clear that there's this cyber security program. Uh, have an actual like legislative agenda. It's more about capacity building uh, from a personal experience. But they have been trying to engage with NGOs. I don't know in the more better like in the most optimal way but again fine so what can we do to actually engage with these international organizations not only the oas but also the ILAC part of this like eco even process or other like regions so i wanted to ask to be more specific to ballet pass how do you see this like international advocacy in terms of cyber security what thing that we can keep ego there to set our expectatives in a realistic manner, because what I've been in this meeting is that you have these human rights activists and specific facts that in some specific state or region in the country, and there's no possible remedy sometimes for those things. So going beyond the how can you actually engage with these organisms, bring some speech, and it comes the time actually to oppose their policy proposals when they are proving not to be like human rights consistent. So um, this is a very open question, but how would you address this in terms of organizing or going there or advocating? So pass on Valeria. That's what <laughs> well, well, um, thing we have to do in international forum is to work as a network of organizations from Latin America. We have to, to have regarding human rights. We, if we work equally, things are you know, But if we are able to set an agenda, a common agenda, uh, regarding human rights and security issues, maybe we can uh, you know, achieve something. Uh, we can pressure in a in a better way to governments or you know uh, different actors. Also, I think we need to figure out a strategy to have someone from civil society organizations that has that presence in all these forums. You know, meeting against the um, you know company. Etc. Et and sometimes we don't have money or resources to have a person there, like working for this um, uh, agenda. In this regard, I think APC has been doing an incredible job. I think uh, Valeria can give us more information about that. But I think we need, you know, to 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 have this, uh, you know, in in in. Area with a person, with a, I don't know how to do it, but it's definitely something that we need to do because we are fighting against other lobbies and sometimes I think uh, civil society organizations from Latin America doesn't have uh, enough representation. I also agree those are very difficult questions. So I think, I think Things can be done. Not if they are going to be successful, successful in the way we do, but as I was saying, it is important to keep trying. So I could say that it is important for us for to deploy a strategy of uh, that control. So sometimes the only thing that we can do is to really to really control and to and to reduce and to ease a little that some policies are posing for our national content.
context. I fully agree with Paz. With with Paz, uh, it is important for us to build the movement around internet rights, and for us, it's important to get feedback and to promote a kind of fertilization strategy with other movements that are, are working and have a experience and are working on other social justice arenas and so this 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 need to strengthen the movement and to build a agenda not only regionally but globally I think is very important particularly if those agendas are fed by perspectives from the global south I think it's it's and I need to play a, a more important role as time passes. I also think that we have to use the mechanisms, the, the human rights mechanisms, mechanisms that we that we have. And, and for that, I am referring particularly to the importance of uh, getting closer to special rapporteurs, for instance, and the council. Uh, you might remember. Yeah, two years, almost two years ago, we had the Human Rights Council adopting an internet-related resolution. This year, the Human Rights Council is going to pass another internet resolution, and that is a very crucial opportunity for us uh, to get our views there and to work with our governments. It is Brazil and Germany and other um, uh, working around this resolution, so we have to get closer to these governments and to fill in our perspectives there. Because once we have this, this, this global instrument, even if not binding, these instruments really be used as a basis for us to push for um, for other approaches to national internet policies. So I have to engage with those mechanisms. And I think it is crucial for us, to, for society organizations, to, to produce our analysis and evidence of how the issues are expressing themselves in our regional and regional context. We have to, we have to build a, a solid, a solid um, analysis as a basis to obviously not only to intervene on the various levels, but also to provide, you know, um, to provide um, knowledge on how these issues are impacting on our own reality. Because they can also be the basis for input or feeding um, policy making processes. And obviously also keep building our own capacity as civil society to meaningfully engage with these processes at national, regional, global, I think it's very important. We have some internet governance schools in Latin America, in Africa, the European one, and so on. So I think we have to keep the, the our capacity. The, the issue is becoming more complex, and the struggle is becoming more complex. So I think we have to be ready to have a more specialized input on issues, for instance, to keep engaging with the um, processes that are still far from civil society horizon, which, for instance, the ICANN processes and so on, and to look at those processes from a, from a human rights lens. And also finding common ground. I know that, uh, I know that counteracting the agenda of uh, corporations is crucial, but we don't have to put on the same basket for all all private sector stakeholders. There are some of them uh, with whom we can have some common ground, and we we could even share some uh, some common human rights struggles with them. Uh, so I think we we have to also um, uh, adopt a political approach to how we engage with corporations. Uh, closer to, to them and understand. Uh, we know that uh, in the last instance, profit is the objective, but, uh, but uh, uh, sometimes they, they could be also our allies, our specific struggle. So we have to, to, to also make uh, our means 
needs and our prejudices, and then to understand how different stakeholders could be allies, not only governments, but also corporations. Uh, thank you, Pastor Maria. Uh, just, I mean, what to take away from both of you is this need to the or sometimes be allied with the private sector discourse. And all of being uh, stakeholders in this hopefully multi stakeholder setting implies exercising uh, that uh, uh, quality. I mean, being an actual stakeholder, trying to influence, trying to interact with the other stakeholders, trying to put speech out there, trying to produce analysis, trying to, try to have someone there. Because sometimes you can, I mean, you can write columns or you can like uh, do a lot of things, but you can complain only so much. At some point, there's an need to take action and to become an actual stakeholder. Responsibilities that you have with that because the sector, they don't stop. They hire lobbyists, public policy officers. And sometimes, uh, um, Valeria was very certain when she said, okay, the, the goal of the private sector is to get, get profit. And if the, even if they're not like actually driving a surveillance state, sometimes these profit opportunities of developing, I don't know, surveillance solutions or giving the, giving a pass to government uh, to be to implement those policies, probably will be profit driven. So the need also to have this from civil society with a tactical approach and having the we we can achieve almost the end of this uh, Q and A session. Uh, so just. A like to make some final remarks and then invite uh, uh, Paz and Valeria to say it also there uh, with one special request I have for them for the last question. Uh, possible to talk about the issues and probably across all of these uh, way, videos and Q and and such you have had the, the discussing a lot of this uh, specifically on how to craft uh, actual speech on cybersecurity, how to put uh, like uh, in a, how to say, uh, how cybersecurity can help human rights and not say, how to, like collide sometimes with the surveillance uh, initiatives from countries. So that, that, that's, there's nothing about that. What's for Latin America is that uh, we can recognize, uh, we have good uh, there has been some successes. Uh, probably, even if the future doesn't look uh, like, uh, as it looked two years ago, there's still a lot of room to do things, to get together. There's uh, just a couple languages, and between Portuguese and Spanish, it's, it's muy fácil hablar ambos. So, um, when you speak Spanish or Portuguese. Uh, so, what I want to say is like, uh, there's this, all of these chances to get together, to alliances, to work together, to, uh, to go achieve them in a better manner. Because if you get any every organization by themselves, they will actually make more mistakes, not getting the point or not being able to act in an international level as they were working with other organizations. So there's this constant need of working, networking, and alliances to, to actually achieve something. For uh, past and Valeria, I want to for them to make their final remarks, but also one, if you want to address these uh, feminist principles on for internet. I think the relation to be made in terms of cyber security and feminism, but it's a current, when you are drafting cyber security stuff, you bring sometimes the gender issue and everybody look at you as if you are a bit crazy. So there's a lot of things to add in, in that uh, regard. And it's an upcoming challenge. When we achieved in the, this uh, current like cyber security strategies of countries or laws, so there's the need to also push this agenda and push this idea of like principles of like um, equality and non-discrimination and the gender issues are at the center of equality and non-discrimination issues. So, uh, but and then I will say goodbye very briefly, and we uh, will be done. And most of them to go to have lunch. Okay. Feminist, the feminist principles, they are an attempt to create a political tool for us to not reproduce uh, the internet 
what we have at the level of the of society, which is a system that oppresses on a broader system that oppresses also men and, and the entire humanity. As, uh, as I was saying, this feminist principles is is a proposal to, to for us, for us to try to to not only patriarchy but also that system that oppresses the whole community based on this model of oppression of 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 women by men. At uh, the end, it is an attempt to build uh, uh, and to imagine a different world of online, and for us to keep handler in terms of uh, building social justice and equity, not only defending women's rights, but also the rights that, that we as a humanity have uh, in terms of ha having better conditions for our lives and for the exercise of our rights. And for our own development. So basically, the principles, they are not, they have, they have to be, to be seen as a tool to fight just for women's rights, no other than that. And you all to hang in there and to keep the possibility to have an open and free internet. It is not easy and probably we won't live enough to see that happening, but uh, but I think we are setting good basis for the next generation to keep, uh, uh, you know, struggling our, our, our around something that we really believe is going to provide the humanity a very strong and powerful tool for achieving social justice. Thank you to Global Partners to, for the invitation and, and Francisco for giving this is for a very, very fruitful discussion. So looking forward to the next one. A feminist internet is basically a critical perspective, it's a progressive perspective uh, regarding the internet uh, that we want. So uh, this has a lot of implications on safety issues. You know? uh, what is the internet of what, what we want? Uh, how we can deal with cybersecurity issues in that you know, framework? Um, so, yes, it's a, it's a very difficult time right now in America, uh, not just Brazil, it's, you know, our countries are facing some really difficult times, especially uh, regarding uh, human rights, civilians, etc. Um, but we have an incredible activist here in the region, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, investigations and uh, campaigns and a lot of things that we can actually um, get on on this on on on, on this. so it's a hard so we need to we have the resources we need to talk more about these issues we need to discuss more about this um not just cyber security but other things regarding technologies digital technologies and i think this has been a great opportunity to do it we need to, you know, we have uh, more instances to do it because it's the only way that we can organize ourselves and our political agenda regarding these issues. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, thank you also for setting all of this up. Uh, we are, like, <laughs> done with this. Uh, well, I think just like for a uh, as I said, be a stakeholder and exercise all of the rights that come with that rights. So thank you again. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Aditi. Thank you, Evan. Uh, if you have any other concern, probably you will be able to reach me. You can ask also Daniela or Aditi if you want my contact. I'm more than open to discuss whatever with you. So thank you. See you until the next Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.